Oh, I'm now very pleased to welcome to the virtual spotlight, Dr. Crystal Sine and Dr. Monica Peake, who will be discussing recent, a recent systematic review funded by PCORI um, that they worked on related to measuring health equity in social care research. I'm gonna stop my share and get us started. So welcome, Dr. Sine. Welcome, Dr. Peek. Um, it's so great to be here with both of you today. I wonder if we could get started with uh, both of you introducing yourself. So I'll start with you, Dr. Sine. If you could just tell us who you are and a little bit about your background um, and yeah, your work. Okay, well, thank you so much, Caroline and the Siren team. It's really great to be here with my friend and colleague, um, Dr. Pete. So I'm Crystal Sine. I am a professor of medicine at the UC San Diego School of Medicine. I'm also the chief administrative officer for health equity, uh, diversity and inclusion at UC San Diego Health. Um, I'm a general internal medicine doctor and a health services health equity researcher. Um, I also uh, am trained as an implementation scientist and a cardiovascular epidemiologist, and it's really great to be here. Most of my research focuses on um, the impact of uh, social networks and social relationships on the health of adults with chronic illnesses and um, intervene, uh, implementing interventions to um, enhance patient and family-centered care. It's good to be here. Fabulous. Dr. Peek. Oh, you're on mute. Maybe double muted. Yeah, no, no. Oh, there we go. Listen, I'm always learning. Um, <laughs> I'm so excited to be here um, to talk about this work that Carolyn, you're a part of um, and that uh, Dr. Sine is a part of. And also just excited, I'm always uh, delighted to be, to be sharing the same space with Crystal. She, we call each other twins. <laughs> uh, we've worked together for so long and are just so similar in so many ways. I love Crystal. Um, I am a professor, uh, the Ellen H. Block Professor of Health Justice, which you know, I'm so excited to have that title. I'm not sure there's another professor of health justice in the country. Um, I'm in the section of general internal medicine at the University of Chicago, and I wear, like Crystal, lots of different hats. Um, I'm in the uh, McLean Center for uh, Clinical Medical Ethics. I'm one of the associate directors there and I'm the director of research. I'm uh, one of the associate directors for our diabetes center, the uh, Chicago Center for Diabetes Translation Research. I'm the executive medical director for clinical health innovation. Um, you know, <laughs> lots of different things. Um, I'm our associate vice chair for faculty research development, which um, allows me to focus on uh, research faculty who are underrepresented in medicine um, and their trajectory for research. So that's a, a new exciting role for me. So um, my uh, research is like crystals in health equity, um, health disparities, and I fo have focused on uh, diabetes, uh, not because I love the pancreas, although I, I'm <laughs> glad mine is functioning, um, but because I think about diabetes as a social disease, um, one in which there are so many different levers um, that we can take advantage of to improve the health of marginalized populations. Um, but ones in which are frequently not functioning well that, rec uh, that result in disparities. Um, and so it's a great sort of model to think about what happens when everything goes to hell um, and we see um, you know, lots of disparities that result. And um, so, uh, but I've also been leaning really heavily in the COVID pandemic. Um, and so spent a lot of my sort of bioethics training thinking about, thinking about that. And, so anyway, I'm just excited to be here. Um, a lot of my work also has been recently in integrating medical and social care, which is why um, I um, was really excited to be involved in this project and to work with Siren and, and everyone, uh, RTI, Crystal, others closely on this project and to talk about it. Great. Well, that's a great segue into this project. So um, could one of you start us off by telling us what did you set out to do with this review? 
Um, why did it happen and what was the goal? So I, um, I'm happy to start. Uh, we all know that we've been talking a lot, um, uh, or the world has been, many of us have been talking about it for a longer period of time, but you know, after 2020 or so, the world has started to talk more about um, structural racism and it, it impacts on health. Um, and really, uh, we actually, um, Monica, Caroline, and Laura, and I started this discussion many years ago, probably four or five years ago, certainly pre-pandemic, of this idea started to percolate um, and it evolved over time, but essentially we landed on what we'll share today. But we know that because of the historical um, and ongoing nature of structural racism, social needs are more prevalent among minoritized racial and ethnic populations. And you know these groups uh, experience socio um, socioeconomic disadvantage differently um, for minoritized groups than white populations populations. Um, and really, despite the many ways that we know that racism affects the effectiveness of social um, needs interventions, which also have gotten a lot of um, interest and examination over the past few years, no one had really uh, examined the extent to which the social needs interventions actually explicitly considered whether and how um, minoritization by race, ethnicity might impact the effectiveness of those interventions. So that's essentially what we sought out to do, and we leveraged the um, the PCORI's uh, February 2022 uh, scoping review, an evidence map of social needs interventions in healthcare settings to actually explore um, this broader idea that we were really trying to understand uh, of how these interventions actually conceptualized and analyzed um, differential in intervention effects by race and ethnicity. But I'll let Monica share kind of what our specific questions were, but that's kind of the global overview. Well, yeah, oh, one thing I, I just wanna add is that, you know, um, I've spent a lot of time, uh, again, sort of thinking about all the different ways in which diabetes needs to work, you know, all the ways the stars need to align to be effective. And so some of that is, you know, patient self-management, some of that is, you know, communication with the doctor, some of that is quality improvement. And so I've also, you know, so I've done more quality improvement than I initially thought I was going to do when I first became a clinical investigator. And one of the things that has always been interesting to me is sort of thinking about the difference between general quality improvement and sort of socio socioculturally tailored quality improvement. And so, you know, as we're doing these interventions to address specific social needs, which really are a reflection of economic um, issues, you know, I don't have enough money to pay the rent to purchase healthy food or to purchase food at all, um, you know, to have, you know, access to clean water from based on where I live, they're all sort of economic issues are we also thinking about the larger sociocultural context in which people live, where they are faced by, you know, issues of immigration, racism, other things in their life that layer on top of and are frequently underlying drivers of these issues. Um, and so, uh, so some of the examples I, I frequently think about are, you know, um, people in this country that are undocumented and don't have access to WIC or SNAP, you know? And so when we're thinking about their access to food, you know, it's gonna be completely different. Uh, their access to healthcare, completely different. And so when we're building out programs, do we take those into consideration? Um, the other thing that I think is really important is that, you know, we, are, we sometimes have separate conversations around uh, racism, and you know, social determinants of health when we know that racism is driving um, differentially these social determinants of health. Um, and one of the things that we note in our paper are some specific examples of how that may play out. So um, for example, um, we, when we think about structural racism, the, the differential access to good services and opportunities and risk, that has resulted in, um, as one example, residential segregation, um, where there's you know lower quality housing, education, lots of concentrated poverty, all these things sort of in a physical neighborhood. 
So people who are living in those neighborhoods as we're trying to then assign social services and resources may have differential access to those resources if they're living in communities that have, that have fewer resources. Um, or if we say, let's take interpersonal racism. Um, as people are you know, having their vouchers or doing whatever, as they're navigating their way around the community, trying to access these services, we know that you know, discrimination is everywhere. Um, and so that is gonna be an additional barrier for people as they're trying to receive these various goods and services that we're trying to give them um, as you know, part of the, uh, what they're receiving in healthcare. Um, and then we also think about internalized racism. You know, black and brown people aren't the only ones um, who have these beliefs. Um, we also, uh, marginalized populations also inter internalize the same, you know, bad beliefs about ourselves to some degree. And so that manifests sometimes as hopelessness, as uh, decreased self-confidence, um, and that um, can affect our ability to manage chronic diseases, um, to believe that we can overcome some of these barriers. And so it is really important as we think about how racism and all the different ways that it can manifest can impact the effectiveness of these interventions that are designed to address the economic, ultimately, um, shortcomings that a person may have. Um, and so that interplay really hasn't been interrogated enough. And so uh, that uh, is what we were really trying to do. Um, and so, um, so yeah, so some, some of our, our questions were really, you know, how many, uh, so we, so we, oh, I'm sorry, uh, I see uh, Caroline. No, keep making, going, keep going. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm always sensitive to people's facial expressions. I'm like, I'm like <laughs> what's that? Like, like, I always feel like I'm on the Apollo stage. <laughs> Is, am I about to get snatched off because I can just like talk way too much? Um, <laughs> I, I think so, you were just going to tell us about the questions, which is perfect. Yeah, which I don't remember exactly. Oh, I can share. I have them. I have them. Pull. We've been working on this for a while. But um, so just to put a fine point on what Monica was saying, I think many of us know the ways that racism can Im impact health. But one of the things that we were really intentional about was that, you know, many people, because there are no validated measures for structural racism, what we wanted to do is to draw the explicit link between race and racism in this. And we wanted to know how studies actually conceptual, or did they actually specify and articulate that they knew that race was a proxy for structural racism and all the things that kind of stem from that. But we had, um, I guess, uh, four key questions, and I'm just going to go through these very quickly. Um, so we, it's important to note that we looked at multiracial studies um, in multiracial and multi-ethnic populations because we we're specifically interested in examining differential impacts by race and ethnicity. Um, so among those set of studies from the PCORI review, again, we situated this with in this broader um, PCORI review, how many of those studies actually included race or ethnicity in their analysis? Um, and then we you know, described what social needs interventions those studies were addressing. We wanted to know among the studies that did include race or ethnicity in their analysis, and by that we mean, did they look at it as a you know, confounder variable? Did they stratify by it? Did they actually do something um, with the race or ethnicity? Um, among those studies that actually did include it in their analysis, how did they conceptualize it? So again, we were very um, intentional about thinking about um, the extent to which uh, studies actually talked about race as a social construct, as a um, as a, a proxy for structural racism or some other form, because we know it's not a biological um, a, a construct. So we wanted to really see our, our researchers acknowledging that it's not a biological construct, that it's a social and, and specifying what, it, uh, what they think it serves as a proxy for. Um, and then how many of those studies actually examined whether the intervention had differential impacts by race and ethnicity? Um, and the last question was, um, 
or, you know, the last question was around tailoring and the extent to which they tailored their interventions um, based on cultural context, which is what um, Monica was alluding to earlier. Um, and I think one of the things that was unique about our study, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about the results, but in doing this, really focusing on these two big areas, what was the theoretical, conceptual, conceptual, how did they conceptualize race and ethnicity, and how did they then use it in the analysis of the methodological? We wanted to look at the intersection of those in a way. So we wanted to see which studies were sort of thought Thoughtful in the way that they um, conceptualized race and ethnicity um, and uh, were informative in terms of helping us to understand differential impacts, which we believe actually helps us to advance the field of racial um, equity research. So we have these two big constructs that you'll see um, throughout thoughtfulness, um, or which relates to the conceptualization and informativeness, which relates to how they used um, race or ethnicity in the analysis. Thank you. That is great. And will yeah. you remind us again, because I think people may not be familiar with this PCORI evidence map. Can you say a little bit more about what that is? Um, like that, that universe? Or I can share more if that's yeah. helpful too. I was going to say, yeah. why don't you share more? <laughs> <laughs> okay, because we, we did, so our team, so for those who aren't familiar, PCORI has developed, did, um, and is on an ongoing basis, doing a review of the literature for research um, that uh, for interventions addressing social risks, and um, and they all have put that literature review that they're updating on a regular basis, roughly every I think six months or a year. They have put it into a kind of a visual format, and that's the link that was dropped in the chat. And so that's basically the universe of studies that, um, the, that Crystal and Monica uh, focused on in this, and the, you know, those of us that were involved with this focused on um, for this review. So it's basically studies on all sorts of different kinds of interventions, right? So some of them were housing quality interventions to reduce asthma. Some of them were um, community health worker interventions related to um, a whole, you know, social risks for patients with diabetes. I mean, there's a whole range of things, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there were 157 um, studies in the review that we did. And among those 157, we ended up with 152 that actually focused on the multiracial and multi-ethnic population, which was kind of our main um, inclusion criteria. Yeah. Can you say that again, Crystal? Like, why was it that the review focused on multi only on multiracial populations, just to make sure that's clear? Yeah, so um, so this was a, and we'll talk about hopefully later some challenges, but um, it was really important for us to be able to look at differential impacts by race and ethnicity. That was one of our key things that we were interested in. So in order to do that, you actually have to have uh, studies that have multiracial um, and multi-ethnic populations so that we can compare and see if uh, the the effects were differential between the minoritized racial and ethnic groups that might have been in the study and um, uh, Hispanic, non-Hispanic white populations. Uh, but we acknowledge uh, throughout this work um, as an internal team and also in the uh, paper that we write that there is great value and we are big proponents of uh, single race or single ethnicity studies because, you know, we shouldn't, whites are not the standard, right, in this work. And, and a lot of times we, you know, kind of always, and, and reviewers push us to do this and, uh, you know, funders often push us to, you know, think about comparing minoritized racial and ethnic groups to whites. Uh, we don't think that that's the only approach. In fact, there's great value in looking within single race ethnicity studies to be able to see who the positive deviants are, who are, who are people who are doing well, despite the fact that people would expect the group not to do poorly. And we can um, learn a lot uh, from those types of studies. And we certainly push and advocate for them, but that wasn't the um, focus for, for this particular review. So with all that said, what did the review find? Which of you wants to kind of so share I, the punchline? <laughs> I made a slide and I'm technologically challenged. So, <laughs> so I sent it to you, Caroline. Did you get it? Let me 
check. Uh, yes. Okay. Give me just a second if you want to get started and I'll pull it up. Okay. So as Crystal said, we had 152 studies in our evidence map that had multiracial or multi-ethnic populations. Um, and so that's a lot of studies. Um, and I feel like we should do like a, a game show. Like how many do we think um, of those 152, it had race or ethnicity as a variable in their analysis of effectiveness as an outcome? Um, and, um, you know. Come in. I think that was 44. It, it was um, drum roll, right? I right. Drum roll. <laughs> I, mean, I have that on my screen, so I know. Yeah, so it was 29%. So it's, it's this, oh, can you just show the next slide that was just sort of, uh, uh, oh, and you know what? Yeah, yeah, and uh, excuse the word structural racism, I accidentally but put it in the middle. No, 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 go back, <laughs> go back up one. Uh, there we go. Okay, so this is it. So uh, only 44 of those 152, so 29% um, had race or ethnicity. Which I oh, think, yeah. oh, Monica, 44, oh. only four of these 9% were met the definition of what we consider conceptually thoughtful in understanding the root causes of health inequities. And so by that, it's what Crystal was talking about, that race is a social construct, not a biological one. And that, and you know, there's a lot of words we could say, but to condense it down, race is a proxy for social disadvantage. Um, only 12 of these 44, and you can see that I put a little placeholder that I forgot to calculate because um, I did it this morning while I was under the hair dryer. And I hope that you all appreciate <laughs> that I did my hair for this show. So that's 27 <laughs> 27%, so 27% of, <laughs> let me, <laughs> let me um, jump in here, Monica, for a second, because I feel like this is a lot of stuff and let's break it down for people. Um, so going back to the top line, the first thing that you found, if I'm understanding correctly, is that um, you had 100, we had 152 studies, the uh, of uh, interventions addressing social risks in multi-racial and multi-ethnic study populations, only about a third of them, less than a third of them, included race or ethnicity variables in their analyses, right? Is yes. that what that first thing is? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And, I think and that, then, oh, oh yeah, go ahead. No, I mean, I think that just stopping on that point, because yeah. when you think of it, what a missed opportunity. And what does that say about how we think about this construct? It To me, right. and I think what the discussions that we had were that, you know, again, when we think that, you know, it, it's not, I think because it's easy, it's a checkbox, like we can easily gather race data or we have it, whether the quality of it is good is a whole nother conversation, but we think it's, it's a simple variable. And I think it's easy for people to dismiss, but when you really unpack what it is and what it stands for, the fact that, you know, two thirds of studies would not do anything with that variable, would not seek to see how it's affecting the effectiveness of the intervention, would not, not even try to control for it, which again, there are lots of issues with, you know, what are you actually controlling or adjusting for, but they just did nothing with it. You mm -hmm. see it, that it shows up, and then they do not a thing with it. So I think that says a lot about the state of the field and the science and, and people's understanding probably of where, um, you know, what race and ethnicity really means. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you for, for helping to put that in context and explain it. And I think um, I'm curious if you have any thoughts about like, why is it that folks might not be thinking to look for or, you know, think about putting race or ethnicity in the analyses of these kind of studies? You know, um, we actually mention a number of reasons in the paper. Um, there's not enough space. We have sort of limited space. It's not really prioritized by the journals. 
although there's sort of a shift in that recently, um, journals are starting to put um, sort of expectations and normative behaviors around how they're dealing with race and racism and, you know, author instructions about that. So I think that's going to start, and these are high quality journals. So I think that's going to start moving the field. Um, but I think that there still is a lot of people who just don't understand, mm -hmm. um, who um, are used to just sort of grind in the numbers, you know, age, age, gender, race, but don't really have a true understanding, you know, what a machine racism is that has just trampled, you know, brown and black communities. Um, and I think that that is obvious to me when it, when really, I think we have two choices to explain disparities. Either black and brown people are inherently inferior or the system is doing something to black and brown people to give us worse health outcomes. I think those are our two choices. And, you know, <laughs> everybody should be mad as hell if we think it's the latter, but we don't see everybody mad as hell. And so I think that sort of subconsciously, a lot of people have kind of accepted that it's the former because it's kind of easier. We don't have to then do anything about it. We're all these behavioral things, you know, it's, you know, they show up late, there's, you know, uh, um, and so we don't want to take a, a cold, hard look at you know, what we've inherited as a country, what our responsibility is as a community and as a people to right these wrongs, the weight is so heavy for us to lift. Um, and so it's easier just to kind of ignore it. <laughs> you know? and, I think that, and that's the power of it too, Monica. I think that the power of, of structural racism is the fact that we've rendered it invisible, right? As long as we don't show the effects that it has historically and continues to have, then we think that it doesn't exist and we can go on about our way and, and, and look at, as you said, the individuals or their behaviors or, you know, the broad kind of that micro context around them, but not looking at, at the structures, policies, and the practices that perpetuate it. But I think that that's exactly it. And I think the other thing that was really interesting um, with in thinking about that, you know, the fact that only, you know, four of the studies were really um, thoughtful in terms of, you know, what they, how they conceptualize and how they explain that. But the other thing that we found was that um, even among those four, none of them actually provided the, the rationale for sort of how they saw race functioning in their work. None of them talked about that in the introduction or the methods. Those, we been. really found um, evidence of that kind of in the discussion. And you might think, well, what's the big deal? But, you know, part of good science is that we have an idea or conceptualization that we carry through our work. And so we really wanted to see, are you thinking about this at the forefront? Is your introduction the story that you tell? Because we know that story is powerful in the introduction and the way we set up our studies and how we talk about the constructs and then that how we carry it through in the methods. The discussion really just flows from the intro and the methods, right? And then you get your results. But it's really um, the fact that that was kind of almost an afterthought there might have been and none of these stories I mean there were like one-liners here guys we're not talking we're about like a lot of time you know it was kind of one line or few words that and we were liberal like we tried to include everything that might have been um some hint or some acknowledgement that they understood race as a social um and political construct um but we didn't find that and the fact that we didn't find it in the places where you would expect 
um, variables, you know, we're scientists, right? A lot of us. Um, and, you know, if you're not defining your variables and the methods, that's, you know, that's not good science. So it's not just a lack of acknowledgement, but I really would say, and I think our team feels that this is bad science. If you're just putting down, we examine race and ethnicity, something that's clearly a social construct that serves as a proxy for lots of different things, and you're not unpacking that, I would say that, you know, that's not good science and I'm not being judgmental because I've done that, we've all done that. But I think part of what we're trying to do um, in this plenary and I think what Siren's trying to do is really challenge the status quo and get us to move um, to a, a higher heights and kind of deeper depths with the way we think about um, race and ethnicity. That's so well said, um, Crystal. So um, one person in the, in the Q&A is curious in particular about the tailoring. And if you could say a little bit more about um, where there was evidence of the tailoring, any examples that you particularly remember that you might hold up as like, you know, really good, strong tailoring, or if you didn't find any in the literature, like what would you, what do you think like the ideal should be for how you tailor social risk interventions for different populations who particularly those who experience structural racism mm -hmm. so I, most of the studies um typically were uh and unfortunately I, for reasons that are unclear i put structural racism right there in the middle I, the, <laughs> me getting my hair done too many things um so uh, typically relied on human capital as uh, cultural bridges like community health workers or peer mentors um, that was the what most people did and then they usually did one other thing there was like a a range of things that people could do most people had two things um, a community health worker and one other thing um, and and then so most people didn't have a whole sort of toolbox of strategies that they were employing um, and so that fortunately this is, there's a lot of evidence base for these strategies um, and, and they can do a, a lot of, you know, heavy lifting, this one single strategy. But I think that we have to, you know, recognize that, you know, racism is pernicious <laughs> and that if we want to um, overcome the multiple barriers, we have to have a multifaceted strategy um, and relying so heavily on human capital and the community health workers and peer mentors who themselves are the objects of racism and are frequently low wage workers are, you know, they, they themselves may be the recipients of, you know, you know, SNAP and, uh, you know, faced with other sort of structural issues we have to have a multifaceted program um and so that that's just um you know even, so uh, there's a, a, a one um study in particular that was very thoughtful about how they engaged with the community um around you know housing um uh, but still uh the how, how they thought about the intervention. It was like they were doing surveys and wanted to make sure that you know, people didn't get evicted as a result of their intervention and really had a lot of community input. Um, but the interventions themselves um, usually were not um, very uh, comprehensive as far as having multiple ways in which they were trying to tailor them. Mm -hmm. And I think so, the other thing was that they, um, you know, again, as Monica said, the CHWs and peer mentors, uh, navigators were the most common. There were a few studies that used like um, that provided cultural sensitivity training or training on resources that were available to the community. Or um, I think there was one that looked at uh, culturally um, um appropriate sort of food resources uh, in diverse populations. But again, as Monica said, they weren't, um, they didn't address all the different ways that you can tailor. And we have, you know, good literature on all the different ways that you can tailor interventions, but we didn't find anything that was nearly sort of that complete that looked at kind of the various ways um, that you can tailor. And again, I think, you know, one of the challenges uh, with this and with the tailoring is that 
there are so many, again, there's such a breadth of ways that you could tailor. And it's really, and a lot of times that we were, again, as you can imagine in a systematic review, we're trying to think of the things that we could be the most definitive or sure about to count as tailoring. So if they're, because we're tailoring based on race and ethnicity, right? We're trying to think about that. That was kind of the focus. Um, and there are other things that maybe sounded like it could be tailoring based on race and ethnicity, but it was really providing person-centered care. So we had a lot of discussion on where's the line between just providing care that's person-centered versus you're really tailoring it based on race and ethnicity. So that was one of the, the challenges with the tailoring piece of it. So um, there's so many great questions coming in the chat and I'm so sorry that we're not gonna have time to get through to all of them, but I would wonder, cause we've got, um, we've got a really special, um, a special bit to end this session. Um, but so I wonder, um, Crystal and Monica, if you have kind of final thoughts about like what we need to do better. I think there was a great way that this was phrased. How do we support training on this idea of transparency around race and ethnicity? How do we help set and meet the expectations of better science in this area? What would be kind of your quick takeaways, each of you in less than, than 30 seconds? <laughs> So I think it has to do with leadership. Um, so having programs like this, um, uh, anyone who is ever asked to join an editorial board, to be an, a journal editor, to sit in a position of leadership, um, and you're like, ah, more work, um, do it. Um, because that is where the decisions are made. Those are the gatekeepers. Um, we see some of the mistakes that Gemma made and some of the um, you know, corrections that they're trying to do. This is, you know, the, the devil's in the details and you want to be in the room when it happens. Um, you can make those differences. Um, and so right now, right now, everyone has been motivated since 2020 and we have to commit ourselves to the additional work of uh, trying to move this field forward. Um, and so that's what I'm trying to do <laughs> while I'm raising my crazy kids um, is, is do this extra stuff. Um, and, tr and that's what, that's everyone's responsibility, but it's particularly everyone who's on this call's responsibility because we wanna see, a, see the field be better. And so while the, the field is ready to be better, it's our responsibility to say, okay, well, um, this is what it means to talk about race and, and racism. These are the standards, you know, and thank you to those who've already published in that area. Um, let's get everyone on board with the ideas for this. This is what it's going to mean for, you know, X, Y, and Z. And so the more that we talk about it and write about it and have standards about it, the more we, you know, train our trainees about it, the more it's going to become, you know, the new norm. Um, and that's where, that's where we need to go. So I, I know we don't have time, so I, I don't want to um, uh, shortchange Ryan at all. I'll just say part of this, uh, I'm thinking about the agreements and uh, Caroline, you invited us to a brave space. I would say, let's take a brave stance when we think about this. Let's push ourselves um, to, to write these explanations and our methods, insist that our mentees write them, our co-authors write these explanations. Just, it can be one sentence, guys. It, you know, it doesn't have to be a lot, but let's really acknowledge challenge each other to do this because again it's sort of like we often talk about our budget the budget is a moral document I think the space that we provide in our papers I know we have 3,500 words it's not a lot but if we can't use 20 of those words to really um, accurately say what race is a proxy for um, and avoid the perpetuation of scientific racism I think that we would be doing the field and ourselves a, a service so thank you. Thank you so much to both of you. This was really, really fabulous. I wish we had more time for questions, et cetera, but I wanna let everybody know that we are gonna have a, a full hour of breakouts on our third day. And so that'll be an opportunity to delve into more of these issues to discuss with others uh, how to do better. But now um, we're gonna transition to hear from Dr. Ryan Petaway, um, who is a social epidemiologist health equity scholar and a poet who combines all of those into really amazing poetry. So I'm gonna turn it 
over to you, Ryan, um, now. Great, excellent. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. I'm so happy to be here. Um, also, I think this is a perfect spot after that discussion and then the one that's coming up after this for me to start talking about anti-racism, decolonizing us, right? We like to talk about structural racism out there. We're going to go study it and really like think about this. Some of you are all at UCSF. I'm up here in Portland. Aren't our institutions structurally racist? Um, aren't we not paying our fair share property taxes? Aren't we not paying a living wage? How many people that are working at UCSF are women of color, low income, not paid a living wage, exposed to carcinogens at work, and then they become future cancer patients, right? Um, all of the issues are not out there for us to go study and colonize and extract. Sometimes it's us that we need to do our own inner work. And so what I try to do is articulate uh, as a social epidemiologist engaged in critical theory, the ways in which we need to start talking about structural racism, not just as something to be studied, um, but there's something uh, studied out there with something we need to start working on ourselves. And so those last few comments um, that Monica and Crystal shared about, you know, um, the things that we can do ourselves, uh, journal editorial boards, things of that nature, I think it's a good uh, segue into what I'm going to talk about. So uh, I'm going to share a screen. At least I'm going to attempt to share a screen and see how this goes. Okay. Can everyone see this? Excellent. All right. So, uh, there is an abstract somewhere on the website that explains some of this talk. And so I'm gonna save y'all all the all the things and let y'all read that and just get right into it. Um, before I do that, I'm going to um, open us up with some Audrey. You can see behind me right here. Um, Audrey is uh, a core of why I decided to get all bold and audacious and start bringing poetry into peer reviewed public health spaces. Um, and so I think I wanted to start there. And I'll read this quote to you because I, the title of this talk is in part informed by Bill Hooks. Uh, marginality is also a site of radical possibility, a space of resistance, a central location for the production of counter hegemonic discourse uh, that is not, sorry, I'm gonna move this, that is not just found in words and habits of being and in the way one lives, uh, a site one stays in, clings to even because it nourishes one's capacity to resist. It offers one. Uh, it offers to one the possibility of radical perspective from which to see and create and imagine alternatives, new worlds. Um, and with that, I'm gonna read two poems uh, for poetic poetic health justice. Um, and it's getting up. First one. This piece appeared in the International Journal of Epidemiology back in February. I'm pretty sure it's the first poem of its kind to ever appear in the public health peer review literature. Um, again, imagining new futures, resistance, radical possibility. Um, opening new lanes for discourse of structural racism, what it is, what it's not, who it excludes, who it ex uh, includes, excludes, right? So if you think nationally, for example, uh, so I'm, I just made tenure, I'm a social professor now, that puts me like 1% of African-American Amer African male professors in schools of public health nationally, something like that, um, and less than 6% um, of tenure public or tenure track public health faculty are Black nationally, and so we have to ask ourselves who is doing the research about us. Um, is mostly scholars at predominantly white universities and white scholars that are getting funded to do racial inequalities research, right? So what does that mean? Because every time someone gets a grant, their university gets fiscal and administrative and they get to go out and spend money for the university. It has nothing to do with the topic of research. And then on top of that, the scholars themselves, they get tenure, they get to go to conferences, they get to put their kids through college based off of our pain and our suffering, because it's usually only a deficit's focus when they're studying us, right? So the idea is, how can we take control of the story? And how can we call in our own institutions for essentially being structurally racist and engines of racial capitalism and then patting themselves on the back? Um, so I said what I said, I mean every word. Uh, I have a paper in the Journal of Critical Public Health that lays these out in more detail if you wanna check that out. But for now, let's read this poem. Something, something, something by race, 2021. Keep piling our bodies upon our bodies, counting the ways we go silent. We tell them, as we told them for decades, how to care for our limbs before they go missing. How to listen to our lungs and hear the words we push from our scratched throats before the fluid and smoke and scar tissue eat our air, I, Imagine our pleas smell like necrotic not champa cones, wisp of a godless prayer that twists into a line of least squares fade. From spectacular black to something decidedly ordinary. Oh, how quickly we learn to hang degrees on drywall. 
how to squeeze our lives into star models, strip naked for the pleasure of a statistician's lusting parsimonious eyes, finding findings found within findings founded upon foundations found before one could find a spice or a continent to mash. Our bodies, cornerstone. And our cause remains lost. A death with no preceding life is a birth, is it not? Perhaps if we stack our bodies high enough, we can ask the sun not to make us so stackable, so beautiful on paper. All right. Next time you walk by a school of public health or a hospital, you see that cornerstone, think about where that money came from. It probably came from studying us that fiscal and administrative fees are paying somebody's, um, paying somebody's mortgages, paying the bite bills. Um, I got a hat tip to Dr. Lacante Dill, Michigan State right now. Um, she excavated this quote from decolonial scholar uh, Alma Cesaire in her dissertation work when she was at UC Berkeley. I'm also a fellow alum of UC Berkeley. Uh, poetic knowledge is born in the great silence of scientific knowledge. Um, 3,500 words is not a lot of space to say things that we need to say. And sometimes we need to say things that don't have to you know, be in that format. Um, that's the silence that's an erasure of scientific discourse. It basically says that we don't belong. The knowledge from the margins and expressions, creative expressions from the margins, somehow we just leave that out as if it's not a legitimate form of communication, expression of knowledge, right? Um, that's what Bill Hooks talks a lot about. And all my sister talked about this in terms of uh, poetic poetry as a source of knowledge. And of course, in the context of decolonizing, it's important um, that when we see ourselves, and I say, we, those at the margins, people of color, people in uh, queer trans communities, when we see ourselves represented in the public health scholarship, how do we see ourselves? Do we even recognize ourselves? Because who's telling our story and what do we look like? Are we always in a bar chart? Are we always threaded between a regression line? Is that the only time we see ourselves? And for students and scholars and professors and physicians, think about your training. And every time you had a conversation about a person of color or someone from the LGBTQ community, they were being compared to somebody else. You weren't honoring listening to their stories. Like every time you hear a conversation about, for example, health inequalities, and you hear about black health in a classroom, the schools of public health, it's always worse than, it's always compared to white. It's never about joy or resistance or positivity. So these representations that we have in our public health and medical discourse, think about the damage that they're done. They're done by the white gaze for the white gaze, and they're creating representations of our experiences and our truth and our knowledges. And so the question here, um, that Linda Smith, the colonial scholar, indigenous the colonial scholar talks about, um, you know, is raising this idea that this idea of the misrepresentations become truth. And that sometimes we can barely recognize ourselves when we read the papers about us that we had nothing to do with, right? And that's where this piece kind of comes from. Uh, relatives risk, or I am not your data, Ode to Delphine's Walk, part two. Uh, Delphine, my great auntie, passed in 2020. Uh, this poem was written shortly there after that. And so this is like a tribute to her and my reflection as a Black social epidemiologist and what it means for me to be where I am in this space. Uh, she was born in Booth, Alabama, about 20 minutes from Montgomery. Folks will know that Montgomery was the inside of the Civil Rights March in uh, 1965. And so I think about what that meant in 2020 when it was an election year and that my family has roots in Booth. And so the, the literal and symbolic meaning of what it means for me to be where I am because of the progress that we've made and where we started from Booth in the Booth um, and what I can do within this space to uh, to move conversations forward. Okay. Epidemiology. Legions of credentialed humans without the cognitive capacity to comprehend the difference between being at risk and being risked. You wish to plot us and scatter our bones between proximal and distal ends of a sphere to partition our very flesh the way a rock might divide a string bringing forth alluvial futures only to be siphoned off to water fields flooded with ill logics dressed in the discourse of common sense levied with citations designed to engulf our communities with precarity. Armies of statistical engineers manufacturing measures of vulnerability to be paired with pink boa scarves and jet black stilettos. Oh yes, these models are worn. 
like the soles of my great aunt's shoes, broken over stochastic terrains from Booth to Detroit to Portland, 10 decades and 3,100 miles of weathering narratives of risk dangling from manuscript titles like the limbs of Black men Iola loved. And you think you know the curve of her artists because you raised and recorded her blood pressure? You speedometers to count her steps, not knowing the reason she walks, born by a river that has yet to crest, and yet you know what's best for her. Swimming lessons? Part two. You call us out our names, literally refer to us as your lowercase ends. Ignore centuries of resistance embodied and remembered in the melon and the metal of mothers of miles of grace and the folds of their fingers. You regress us. Reduce our resolve to residuals, misspecify our magic as marginal, confuse our truth with your facts. You can kiss this non-parametric ass over its full distribution. You know nothing of relative risk. I am a great nephew. I am a proud son. I am a blossom, the new fruit from a seed dropped long ago and rooted. I am not your data. I am a fist formed to forge futures where knuckles heal and hearts mend in the company of home and alluvial gifts springing forth from soil where my aunt's arches press rainwater towards the sky, stretched open by sounds of organs and bad hips dancing in ceremony. I am not your data. I am your future. I am in communion with visionaries peering into reviews of our hues. We are the remakers, the remixed, resampling, repurposed on the re up to reimagine and reclaim causal relationships, the effects reestimated, the reminder, the rearticulation, the power from margins correcting your errors because ours are correct. We love ourselves fully, unadjusted. So, no. We do not flatten curves, we bend arcs. And that's net. Um, I'll leave this quote here. This is how I move, this is what I try to do. Um, if there's time, I can take a question. Otherwise, I wanna drop this here. Opening new lanes, uh, really putting bell hooks, Audrey Lord and others into practice. Uh, this is the first ever peer reviewed standing poetry section in a public health journal. Uh, created, dreamed up, made manifest uh, with co-conspirators and homies, Dr. Lacante Gill at Michigan State University, uh, Lacante Gill at Michigan State University, Shanae Birch is currently at Columbia doing a doctor program. Submissions uh, are open, so if you got some bars, you got some fire, you know what to do with it, send it to us, we'll try to find it at home. Um, and I should say that that second poem I read is coming out in the journal Critical Public Health like soon, maybe tomorrow or the next day. And so um, if you have questions, feel free to email me. Um, if there's a question, I can stay here. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, folks are interested in um, staying in touch. So I don't know if you've got, I think it looks like your email is up on the screen in the bottom left hand corner. And yeah. then, um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, it was very, very powerful. You're a blessing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I'm so happy to share this space with y'all. Great. Well, folks, um, we're going to transition now to other sessions. Um, but I think our morning plenary has given us uh, a lot to think about. Um, both inspiration and motivation to do differently and better because we've got to create a better world. It's, it's on us, it's on all of us. But thank you all. Um, and you can join other sessions by going back to the lobby and clicking on join. Thanks everybody. Thanks again to Monica, Crystal and Ryan. Thank you so much.